The Leap Mound Interpretive Trail is sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration, the Georgia Department of Transportation, and the University of West Georgia. Hi, and welcome to another Leak Mounds Interpretive Trail podcast. If you're following along on the trail, this podcast corresponds to the Unwritten Record panel. I'm Marcus Toft. And I'm Jennifer Teeter. Jennifer, what are we talking about when we say unwritten record? Oral traditions. Such as? Such as the legend of Cherokee creation from the Eastern Band of Cherokee in North Carolina that we're going to be reading this podcast. Right. But before we do that, let's uh, maybe talk a little bit about the nature of oral traditions and uh, their importance. Well, they're really important to archaeologists because they can help them learn about cultures, and they really supplement artifacts and other things that archaeologists might find. Right, because uh, as we've talked about in a lot of these panels, uh, especially at the Leak site and in most American Indian archaeological sites, there's no written records, which makes it hard to interpret the objects that are being found. Right, and that's where oral traditions come in, because they're not written, they're passed down from one person to another throughout the generations. And they can shed light on a lot of the things that archaeologists may find and give information, provide information about how something was used or even what something is. Yeah, as we're going to see as we read and analyze the legend of Cherokee creation, we're going to see how they show what cultures believed about specific things and they really tell a lot about a society. But be, Jennifer, because this is a Cherokee story, wouldn't this say more about the Cherokee society than it would about like the people who lived at the Leak site? Well, this specific uh, story is from from the Cherokee, so it's contact period we're talking about. But there are a lot of things that we can really tie back to the woodland and Mississippian cultures. And because these stories, oftentimes, as you mentioned, were passed down from generation to generation, even though they're told by more contemporary people, they have their roots or their origins much further back in the past, you know, possibly hundreds, thousands of years. Yeah, I think that's a, a, it's a safe assumption that we can make, that there are at least loose correlations between these stories and woodland society or culture. Right. Yeah, I mean, we have to be careful when trying to use these to interpret objects, but it can be a useful um, way to help archaeologists understand what they're finding. Yeah, it's not going to be a direct, well, the woodland people <laughs> believe this, and on every other Tuesday they did this. <laughs> right, but it, it, uh, it's not an exact science, basically. Yeah, there's going to be some common elements from woodland, Mississippian, and contact period tribes. All right, well, should we uh, begin? Yes. All right. And the way we're going to do this is kind of read part of it and then take a break and kind of analyze what was in that section of the story. So everything that we're reading is from the same story. We just want to analyze it when we get to something important. All right. Earth is floating on the waters like a big island, hanging from four rawhide ropes fastened at the top of the sacred four directions. The ropes are tied to the ceiling of the sky, which is made of hard rock crystal. When the ropes break, this world will come tumbling down and all living things will fall with it and die. Then everything will be as if the earth had never existed, for water will cover it. Maybe the white man will bring this about. Yeah, so here we can start to see a lot of the elements that we talked about that are common throughout woodland, Mississippian, and contact societies. Yeah, for example, four sacred directions. Right. A lot of the structures that archaeologists find, at even sites like the Leak site, are often aligned to the four directions. Right. Four was a very important number, and the four directions were really important, we think, to older societies, but we at least know to the Cherokee. Right. And it says that um, that the sky is made of hard rock crystal, and we know um, from Cherokee traditions that crystals uh, were often sacred, and in fact, uh, quartz crystals were found at the leak site. Right. And I think it's interesting to point out that this idea is not even exclusive to American Indians. During the Renaissance in Europe, there are some similar ideas about the makeup of the sky and the universe. Which is super interesting because obviously those cultures didn't interact. I mean, these were right, developed separately. 
Exactly. And that last sentence is is telling too of the time that this story um, was maybe told or parts of it originated. It says maybe the white man will bring this about. So obviously this was this rendition of the story was told um, during a time of turmoil when the presence of the white man was really changing the American Indian way of life. Right. They they think that the world may come to the come to an end and could possibly be the white man's fault. Right. Well, in the beginning also water covered everything. Though living creatures existed, their home was up there above the rainbow, and it was crowded. We are all jammed together, the animals said. We need more room. Wondering what was under the water, they sent Water Beetle to look around. Water Beetle skimmed over the surface but couldn't find any solid footing, so he dived to the bottom and brought up a little dab of soft mud. Magically, the mud spread out in the four directions and became this island we are living on, this earth. Someone powerful then fastened it to the sky ceiling with ropes. In the beginning, the earth was flat, soft, and moist. All the animals were eager to live on it, and they kept sending down birds to see if the mud had dried and hardened enough to take their weight. But the birds flew back and said that there was still no spot they could perch on. Then the animals sent Grandfather Buzzard down. He flew very close and saw that the earth was still soft. But when he glided low, by that time Buzzard was tired and dragging. When he flapped his wings down, they made a valley where they touched the earth. When he swept them up, they made a mountain. The animals watching from above the rainbow said, If he keeps on, there will be only mountains. And they made him come back. That's why we have so many mountains in Cherokee land. At last, the earth was hard and dry enough, and the animals descended. They couldn't see very well because they had no sun or moon, and someone said, Let's grab sun from up there behind the rainbow. Let's get him down, too. Pulling sun down, they told him, Here's a road for you. And showed him the way to go from east to west. So I think... The most important question that this section answers, just in general, is why. Yeah, why was the Earth created? And then why is why was the environment the way it was? Right. So it's basically in the in the sky where all of the beings are at this point. It just gets too crowded. Yeah, and they need more room. Yep. So they send animals down. And those animals shape the environment. So, like, Grandfather Buzzard made the mountains with his wings. Well, and even before that, the water beetle technically created the earth by bringing up that mud. We both have our favorite animals, Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> We're both <laughs> worth mentioning. <laughs> and I think it is important to mention that these animals are of some significance to sure, these they're, people. They're not in the story randomly. And the buzzard is something that we can tie back to woodland period societies. There's Rock Eagle out near Athens, Georgia. The stone uh, mound? Yeah, it's a stone mound, and it's actually a buzzard. Oh, okay. It's a little misnomer. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, and then the last kind of part of this, which kind of has to do, I guess, with the environment, is it explains how the sun came to move from east to west. Yeah, it explains that. And then it also mentions a sort of higher power. Yeah, someone powerful is referenced in this story. Okay, so let's continue. All right. Now they had light, but it was much too hot because sun was too close to the earth. The crawfish had his back sticking out of a stream, and sun burned it red. His meat was spoiled forever, and the people still won't eat crawfish. Everyone asked the sorcerers, the shamans, to put sun higher. They pushed him up as high as a man, but it was still too hot. So they pushed him farther, but it wasn't far enough. They tried four times, and when they had sun up to the height of four men, he was just hot enough. Everyone was satisfied, so they left him there. Before making humans, someone powerful had created plants and animals and had told them to stay awake and watch for seven days and seven nights. But most of the plants and animals couldn't manage it. Some fell asleep after one day, some after two days. Among the trees and other plants, only the cedar, pine, holly, and laurel were still awake on the eighth morning. Someone powerful said to them, Because you watched and stayed awake as you had been told, you will not lose your hair in the winter. So these plants stay green all the time. I think this has my favorite part of the story. I like how they explain why people don't eat crawfish. Yeah. Or should stay away from it because it's meat spoiled. And uh, again, we see some of that sacred, uh, the, some of the sacred numbers. They tried four times to get the sun to the right height. And when they did, he w it was at the height of four men. Someone powerful told the animals and plants to stay awake for seven days and seven nights. Right. Seven was an important number to the Cherokee. And again, another kind of cross-cultural uh, reference is that seven is a sacred number in, in different cultures. Right. And then my favorite part is about the evergreens that those uh, plants were the only ones that stayed awake until that eighth morning, 
And so they don't lose, the source says they don't lose their hair, they stay green all the time. Right, so again, we can just really see how they're explaining their environment. Mm -hmm. So things that they might not have scientifically understood, they could answer it through these myths and stories. Right. Well, should we keep going? Yes. All right. After creating plants and animals, someone powerful made man and his sister. The man poked her with a fish and told her to go give birth. After seven days, she had a baby, and after seven more days, she had another, and every seven days, another came. The humans increased so quickly that someone powerful, thinking there would soon be no more room on this earth, arranged things so that a woman could have only one child every year, and that's how it was. So this one again has some of the themes that we've seen so far. Like they mentioned someone powerful. The number seven. And symbolism. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, maybe one of the strange elements to this part is that is that sentence, the man poked her with a fish and told her to go give birth. And the fish seems kind of strange there, but when you, from what we know of the Cherokee um, mythology, the fish represented fertility. Yeah, exactly. The fish is very symbolic to the Cherokee. And then, the, again, this also explains how or why something is. In this case, why is it um, that maybe on average a woman you know, has one child a year? Yeah, and it's because someone powerful had created or done things in such a way that it made that the way that it was. Right, so that they didn't run out of room on Earth, which was the reason that they created the Earth to begin with. Right. Now there's still another world under the one we live on. You can reach it by going down a spring, a water hole, but you need underworld people to be your scouts and guide you. The world under our earth is exactly like ours, except that it's winter down there when the summer is here. We can see that easily because spring water is warmer than the air in winter and cooler than the air in summer. So in this one it explains a lot too, uh, how they view the world. Yep, and talks about the underworld, which uh, is important not only to the Cherokees, but to cultures throughout the world. Um, and in this story, it says specifically that you could reach the underworld by going down a spring or a water hole, um, which usually in, in cultures access to the underworld. I think those are sacred places, whether it was a cave or a spring or something like that. And we know that Middle Woodland people, like those that lived at the Leak site, um, did uh, hold caves to be sacred. And there was that cave, uh, the Lad's Cave, near the site. Right. And this part also sort of shows us how they arrived at these conclusions, such as... The water was cold when it came out of the spring, colder than the air, so therefore it must be cold in the underworld when it's warm like right here. <clears throat> so Marcus, let's sort of just summarize what all this story and just oral traditions in general can help us learn about contemporary American Indian societies and maybe the woodland period. Sure. <clears throat> I think in this Cherokee creation story, you know, the the fact that several numbers are repeated, you know, tells us that those numbers are sacred. We learn about some of the animals that are important to them, and we learn how some of those animals got their characteristics, like the red back of a, of a crayfish or a crawfish. We see why the earth looks the way it does in some places, like the valleys and the mountains were created by the buzzard's wings. We see, you know, reasons for something like the fact that a pregnancy is nine months or a year is you know, so that the earth didn't become populated too quickly. So there's a lot of explanation about the way the world works. Yeah, I think it's a lot of why and how. But I think mm. something that we didn't really see that much of, except for the crawfish part in this, was it explained behavior. Why people didn't eat crawfish. Because right. the meat had been spoiled. And, and remember, too, this is just one of, you know, many stories that they have. Yeah, and this is specific to a certain tribe of people. Mm -hmm. uh, a tribe 10 miles away might have had a different story or different behavior, so their oral traditions would have been adapted to. Sure. Well, depending on their circumstances and yeah, what affected the way that they viewed the world. Right. But so archaeologists can take this kind of information and apply it to the stuff that they find. Right. Like like we've mentioned before, why quartz might have been important to them, so why archaeologists would find quartz there, or how buildings are positioned. Or, um, you know, in this story, it was the water beetle that went down uh, below the water and pulled up the mud. In some other creation stories, it's a duck that does that. And one of the cool artifacts that they found at the leak site was that duck effigy, that clay figure, which okay. um, one of the ways they're interpreting it right now is that uh, it was because that animal was sacred to them and may be tied to a creation myth. All right. And this this myth is from North Carolina. So a duck could have could have been the animal that the people at the leak site right. thought had done the same as the water beetle. 
Well, I think that's a good stopping point. If you'd like to read more oral traditions, you can check out the book History, Myths, and Sacred Formulas of the Cherokees by James Mooney. And go online, too, and just uh, search some of the tribal websites. They usually have a list of, you know, many of these stories. That's where I found this one for this podcast. There you go. So thanks for listening. The Leaf Mounds Interpretive Trail Project was done in partnership with the city of Cartersville, and Bartow County. A special thanks to the Eastern Band of Cherokee, music by Tommy Wildcat.